Inflation helped draw attention to problems that emerge when sectors of the economy rely on just a few big companies. It can have consequences for prices. And according to a new think tank, it can mean broader problems too. Robin Chaban is co-founder and senior economist of Vivek Research. She's also co-founder and director of the newly created Canadian Anti-Monopoly Project. And she joins us now on the line from the nation's capital to explain. Welcome. Thanks for having me. All right, so let's start off with what exactly the Canadian Anti-Monopoly Project is. Well, like you said, the Canadian Anti-Monopoly Project, or as we call it, CAMP, is a new think tank that we have recently launched. And the goal of CAMP is to advocate for policy changes to make our economy more democratic and fair. Uh, what that means in large part is creating policies that tackle monopolies and other forms of corporate concentrated power. All right, when we talk about sort of Canada specifically, why do you think such an organization here should exist? Well, Canada has, um, I think a lot of people can acknowledge a lot of, um, I wouldn't say monopolies specifically. Another word that we like to use is oligopoly, but oligopoly represents uh, markets or firms that um, there's a small number of them that, that serve a market. So when you think of airlines, you think of banking, you think of telecom, these are oligopolistic markets. And they bring many of the same issues that the traditional pure monopoly does. You have these concentrations of corporate power, which leads to less choice for consumers, higher prices for consumers, and ultimately less ability for people to um, exercise autonomy and um, make decisions when they come to purchase goods and services they need every day. So you talked about some industries there, airlines, you talked about telecoms. Uh, give me some, some major players here. Who are we talking about when we talk about uh, monopolies? Right. So uh, what's interesting, and I think something that CAMP can really contribute to the conversation, is uh, the fact that although there are these you know, pretty popular, well-known oligopolies in Canada, there are also... Um, oligopolistic firms in other perhaps lesser known industries. Uh, something that I think is really interesting is concentration when it comes to transportation within Canada. Um, and this has some major implications when it comes to infrastructure in Canada uh, and transportation networks. So for example, um, we recently had not too many years ago now, pre-pandemic uh, merger that consolidated um, the transportation networks for refrigerated trucking. And mm. this happened right before the pandemic. Um, I wonder how much better able we'd be, be able to uh, deliver vaccines at the peak of the pandemic had we had more network infrastructure that was spread amongst more players, making our network more nimble and better able to deliver this critical service to people. So it has these real world implications beyond kind of the big, uh, I, I would say more visible competition problems like again, telecom banking and uh, uh, airlines, for example. All right. Let's, you talked a little bit about sort of the democratic process here, and I'm curious to know when we talk about monopolies and olig give me the pronunciation again. Yeah. No, we're talking about oligopolies. So Oligo again, okay. uh, yeah, oligopoly is when you have a small number of players that dominate a market. Uh, monopoly is when you have one player. And in most markets in Canada, we don't have a pure monopoly, although that's not always the case. Uh, but in most cases, when we're talking about markets that lack competition, we're talking about oligopolistic markets. And again, a lot of the same problems that plague monopolies are also uh, present in markets where you have a small number of players that are offering products and, and goods. Is it bad for democracy to have such a maybe not a fair playing field? Well, yeah, of course. And I think there's a few channels to this. Uh, there's a growing body of research that's looking into the relationship between corporate concentration, corporate power, and um, political influence. So 
I think anecdotally, we can see this uh, sort of dynamic play out, but there's a growing body of research that's looking at this more on a, a systematic level. Um, there's also the connection of democracy and inequality. When we have societies that are unequal, where not everyone has the same ability to participate in society and exercise agency in uh, economic terms, it undermines our ability to um, create the conditions for a healthy democracy. And, and I actually look at, I think a lot about the uh, political turmoil that we've been seeing, you know, in Canada and around the world. Uh, and I think that there are a lot of economic roots to that problem, um, inequality in particular. So we need to be ensuring that everyone has access to the physical resources that they need in order to thrive. And economic equity and economic fairness is really important to that. Oligopolies and monopolies uh, prevent that sort of uh, fairness that we need. I, I'm curious to know, why do you think companies, and one company that comes to mind is someone like Amazon, uh, have been allowed to sort of become so large over the last decade or 15 years? Well, uh, in large part, well, large part might be a bit of an overstatement, but uh, part of why this is the case is because um, policymakers have permitted it to, to be that way. Uh, what's interesting about Amazon is that um, the federal government's uh, industry committee, uh, the parliamentary committee on industry, actually had a study involving Amazon almost 20 years ago now in 2000. So at this point, Amazon was uh, a burgeoning new company. They launched in 1997, if I'm not mistaken. And Parliament was looking at this new firm thinking, hmm, like, this isn't something we've seen before. They're engaging in these business practices that are unusual. They're pretty aggressive. What does this mean for competition? And the experts that they uh, brought in to testify on this said, oh, don't worry about it. You know, Amazon, yeah, they're engaging in some of these interesting practices. Uh, bundling is one example where you sell one product really cheap, you sell another product for more, and it allows you to capture greater swaths of the market and become dominant without actually competing on the merits of, of what you're providing, like better service. So the experts that Parliament drew on said, well, you know what, it's fine. Let Amazon do this because Amazon seems to be a cool, innovative company. If we let them get big, it'll be great because everyone will benefit from this. And, you know, the nature of competition is such that in the long run, some new Amazon's going to come around mm -hmm. and compete this current Amazon out of business. And this is just how capitalism works. Uh, I think we can look 20 years down the road and say, ah, I don't know, were they right about that? Um, so, I, you know, a lot of it is policy decisions, and that's why the work of CAMP is so important. I want to talk a little bit about uh, the money there and the consumer aspect, and I'm sure my neighbors next door who get their Amazon packages delivered every other day uh, might say, hey, you know, Amazon size has helped it bring down its prices, and is that not a net benefit for consumers? Yeah, and this is a, this is a conundrum that um, the government has been grappling with for a century. And uh, that's not an exaggeration. Canada's competition law, which is a, a core uh, piece of legislation that regulates monopolies and oligopolies, was created um, prior to the 1900s. So we've had this law in the books for over a century. And when this law was first created, parliamentarians debated, well, you know, if we have bigger firms, aren't they more efficient? Don't we get better production costs? I think that this is definitely an important consideration in the scheme of things. The problem is that in Canada, we prioritize these cost savings to the detriment of consumers. So for example, in the 1990s, there was a merger between two propane distribution companies, Superior Propane and ICG Propane. And the merger created 
literal monopolies. So one propane distribution company in 16 communities across Canada. So what that meant is for people who needed propane to heat their homes, to run their barbecues, to uh, run their business, they only had one propane company they could go to within driving distance. This merger was permitted to happen because the parties argued that it created massive cost savings. And furthermore, these cost savings, they weren't passed on to consumers. They led to higher profits. Our law is designed to permit these sorts of business activities, these sorts of mergers. Um, and so we prioritize these cost savings over the benefits of con to accrued to consumers and workers for that matter. So is it a factor to consider? Yes, but it needs to be considered in perspective. And that's what we're really lacking right now. All right, I wanna talk a little bit about CAMP. Uh, given that some of the biggest monopolies are based in the US, uh, how much of an impact do you think uh, a Canadian organization can have? There are, you're right, a lot of the big monopolies that we talk about today, Google, Facebook, uh, they're based in the United States. However, because these companies operate in Canada, they do fall under Canadian law. So Canada and its legislation does have some power to address these issues. I think your question also points to a reality that these problems are not just national, they're global. And that's why we're seeing actually a rise in organizations like CAMP across the globe. We have organizations advocating for greater economic fairness and uh, economic democracy in the United States. We also have it in uh, organizations in the UK and other places in Europe. And we're developing a network ultimately of advocates that are pushing for um, laws that curb oligopolies and monopolies so that we have an economy that works for everyone. All right, so we talked about democracy. We talked about sort of the, the price point for consumers. One thing I think is super important and an interesting one is how monopolies affect the labor market. And I think one sort of recent example that we've talked about a little bit is sort of the, the hero pay that frontline workers in supermarkets got. Tell us a little bit about that and how that affects the labor market as well. Sure. So it's only really in the last maybe five or 10 years that policymakers concerned with issues of competition have actually turned their attention to the impact of that poor competition in labor markets. And this is a massive oversight because competition, oligopoly, monopoly, these issues have real impacts on workers. It reduces the ability for people to earn higher wages and also leads to reductions in the quality of work. So whether that's the hours you work or the benefits you get from work, these sorts of things. So uh, a, a good example of the deficiencies we have in our laws and policies today is this hero pay example you brought up. Um, so in that case, grocery stores, um, Sobeys uh, was one of them, um, increased pay for workers uh, in the height of the pandemic. Uh, they then uh, had some informal conversations with each other uh, so that they effectively coordinated a cut in the hero pay. So they coordinated a reduction in the compensation for their workers, um, you know, at large. Normally, this is very illegal, but because of the way our law was structured at the time, this sort of collusion was permissible. There was nothing the Competition Bureau could do. Since then, the Liberal government has implemented um, in its recent Budget Implementation Act uh, a new provision that would make um, collusions uh, in this way criminal. However, there are many deficiencies still in the law. Um, this sort of provision isn't going to capture behaviors where you don't have a really clear paper trail, for example. And in a, case, in a reality where uh, you know, things are becoming more digital, uh, it's easier than ever to just erase your paper trail and, and leave no trace of collusive agreements to suppress wages for workers. When we talk about camp, I'm curious, um, in terms of tangible things you guys are trying to achieve, but also what are you focusing right now on uh, in terms of your efforts? 
So our biggest push right now is to move the needle on reforming the Competition Act. So like I mentioned before, um, our competition laws are one of our key instruments we have today to curb excess corporate power. And there's some severe deficiencies with the law. The federal government has announced a review of the act, and we're hoping to contribute to that by providing constructive input that um, brings a consumer uh, focused perspective while also capturing the needs of workers, small businesses, farmers, and other players in the economy beyond big business that are impacted by competition law. So that's a, a really big push for us right now. All right. Uh, before we wrap, I do want to ask one question. I think that for a lot of small towns, you hear, you know, the excitement around big department stores coming in. And I'm curious the impact monopolies have on sort of the characteristics of, of small towns. How does that change sort of the small town vibe? I know I, in Belleville, for example, there's lots of talk about a Costco coming. But uh, what are the impacts of that on the grounds? Yeah, that's an excellent question. And that's something that we touch on with Camp as well. One of our co-founders, uh, well, I'll give out to a, a shout out to our co-founders. We have Keldon Vester, who is an independent researcher and uh, an expert in telecommunications policy on our, um, on our board. We also have Andrew Cameron. And Andrew has uh, undertaken a lot of important advocacy work on his own looking at the impact of monopolies and corporate power on small towns. He has launched the Center, um, the Center for Small Town Success, uh, and he also has a podcast called Monopolies Killed My Hometown. And in his podcast, Andrew explores how uh, the rise of big business has changed the landscape of his town of Amherst, Nova Scotia. And his podcast is excellent if you're interested in learning more about monopoly, corporate power, and why it's important for small towns and communities. Um, but to, to answer your question in particular, part of the problem of having big businesses come and enter these small towns and change the landscape of them is, again, back to one of our core themes with camp. It removes this feeling of uh, economic agency and economic power and centralizes economic power in the large retailers that move into the community. So we lose some of these you know, important neighborhood stores and locations and people become beholden to the large retailers that exist in their town, both uh, from a consumer standpoint, but also from a worker standpoint. So it, uh, it's really important to have um, a diffusion of economic power within our communities so that everyone has the uh, agency and ability to engage in the economy on fair terms so that they can meet their, their basic needs and, uh, and ultimately be fulfilled as humans. Robin, it's always great to have you on the program. Thank you so much for this and great good luck with camp. Thank you so much, it was a pleasure. The Agenda with Steve Pakin is made possible through generous philanthropic contributions from viewers like you. Thank you for supporting TVO's journalism.